Everybody settled? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, I mean, Alana, congratulations. Thank you. You so have thank you. just come through your first season on Comedy Central and been renewed for a second. It's an exciting time. Can you take us back a little bit and talk about how you began initially with the web series? So, Abby and I um, were taking classes at the theater slash school that Amy founded um, with three others, with the UCB4 called Upright Citizens Brigade Theater and School. And we took classes there, but never a class together, but we found each other in a practice team outside of classes. And um, we got to this point where we, um, we wanted to be able to, you know, we were doing improv, so you come away with ideas, but we didn't have scripts, for example. Um, it wasn't like a tangible thing that we could share. We, we say that we wanted to send a link to our parents. <laughs> so we decided web series is, were becoming a uh, vehicle at the time. And um, we decided to make something together. And we, we met in a pizza shop, as all amazing things um, <laughs> Uh, begin at yuck, and yuck. Um, we met in a pizza shop and we were like what what should this web series be about and um, we just decided it was sort of our friendship was this sort of new dynamic for the both of us and we were like let's let's just make it about us let's just heighten this dynamic and then we started just like we just started writing ideas concepts that are very New York based very New York situations that we were um, going through it was like we were in our early 20s we're now um, much, much older than that. And um, so, yeah, we would just start and we, it was, we got a lot of people that were in the New York community involved too, the people that would help us direct and edit. And we were just making them and putting them on the web. Um, started to get some really good feedback. And then we were like, let's just keep <laughs> making them. Yeah, we made um, 35 webisodes. Wow. And uh, we have had these viewers who were really quality viewers. If they watched one and, and liked it, you know, it's either for you or not. If they watched one, they watched all and they shared all. This um, project was definitely echoed on Facebook. That's where we, like, social media was a, a huge part of this project. Did you have, at, at any point, did you, were you, did you have the ambition to transfer it to television? Was this from the outset or what, did it kind of grow? Sort of like midway through, we had two seasons of the web series, and um, we, we took like a month off in the middle, and we were like, let's, we're going to write all of them. We're going to treat it like it's a television show for the web. We're going to write every episode, and in the middle, we're going to have these little mini episodes called Hack into Broad City, which was all video chat conversations that we ended up using uh, in the TV show as well. But um, yeah, we, we planned it out, and we, we started to really take it seriously. We started to pay everybody. That was working wow. for us. So little. <laughs> Not now. just in That's food. Um. It used to be bagels, then it became paper dollars. Um, <laughs> but looking back, it's like still like this magical thing that people got on the train and, and added to it and kept the momentum, momentum going with us. Yeah. Okay. And then Amy, I'm going to shift around here. <laughs> You guys mentioned Upright Citizens Brigade. So is that how you came to know? Yes, Abby and Alana were young uh, and up-and-coming performers in New York City kind of creating their own content and asked me to participate in one of their videos. And uh, I, I, I had heard about Broad City um, and, and seen their stuff online, and they were shooting very close to my apartment. Um, <laughs> so that we, it was all... It, uh, exciting afternoon, and I immediately uh, w was attracted to their comedy and to their chemistry and their voice, and saw how they had been working very hard with very little, and were ready for the next step. So after that day, we just started talking about collaborating, and then we put our hands together, you know, and our heads together, and said, "I'll see you in Cannes," and here we are. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, and you're a busy woman to begin with. I mean, yeah, well, between yeah. Parks and Recreation and everything else that you do, your new series, Welcome to Sweden. Yeah, oh, thank Parks you. And yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. So you must have really believed in it to want to get involved. Very much. Uh, well, I was excited about... Um, 
I was excited about, it just felt very organic, as most good things tend to be, and it felt like a similar language we were speaking, but I felt my experience at this point was, um, could be of use, and I was excited to work with Kent again. Kent and I uh, worked together on a, a show on Comedy Central like 15 years ago called Upright Citizens Brigade, and we did a sketch show back then, and so it all kind of fell, fell together naturally, um, and I was interested in producing and directing more, which is where I'm excited to go next. So Sure. Okay. So, so you actually were the person that brought Kent in. Is that, is that yeah, correct? Yeah. I would say we, we, brought, we brought the show to Comedy Central along with Brooke Posh. And, and we kind of presented this idea. And if I may brag about Comedy Central for a moment. You may. Um, <laughs> there is a, really a myriad of, of uh, fresh interesting and really funny shows on that channel right now. Um, Broad City, Key and Peele, Kroll Show, Amy Schumer, all these big kind of new American comedies that are really in the zeitgeist. And so it was a nice time for us to join that pack. And there's also a history of Comedy Central taking shows from the web. You have Drunk History and Workaholics, right? So what about Broad City fit with Comedy Central's sort of brand and, and programming and strategy in, in that regard. Well, I have to give one caveat. I have not seen the show yet, but <laughs> the, from the buzz, it sounds really good. Um, no, I, I think the main thing about the web is just the exposure. It's a great way to get to know not only you know them as talent, but also you can see, Amy mentioned their work ethic, you can see how much they put into it. So there's a lot of other aspects, but ultimately the thing that matters the most is the talent and the creative vision, and that was clear from the beginning. So, uh, you know, just based on the web series and then once they came in and started talking about how they would expand it to series, it seemed really appealing. You know, a lot of people ask about, oh, but it's, you have a ma predominantly male audience, this is a female show. And to me, funny is funny, and the thing that matters more than anything is that they are hilarious and so appealing and so genuine. And aren't aren't they also getting through. quite a bit of male viewership yeah. in the demographic? I mean, isn't a exactly, that, as we yeah. expected. And um, because I don't think there's anything exclusive about their, their comedy and their sensibility. And so for us, it wasn't, you know, I don't really think in terms of, you know, whether it's male, female, black, white, brown, whatever. Uh, is it funny? And, if, and does it have a very strong point of view and vision, which, which they have? So it always felt like, oh, maybe more women will watch than normally would, but it would never be at the expense of the male audience that's already there. It just would be additive. Sure. Okay. Well, given that you have this history with, with doing other transfers, how much do you see the web as kind of an incubator of, of comedy right now? Oh, I think it's an incredible incubator. Um, you know, obviously at this point, uh, technology has gotten so cheap that anyone can have a camera and editing equipment in their hands for almost anything. So there's nothing holding anyone back. And ultimately, if people do have a strong point of view and vision and, and, and a will, there's an incredible work ethic that goes with it. And if they express all those things, uh, then nothing holds anyone back, I think. And the cream always rises to the top. So it gives people a good access to exposure. What, what makes it work now? I'm actually I'm interested because remember several years ago there were some attempts to do this, to, to transfer from the web to television. And it was more so the broadcast networks that were, that were making the attempts and they really didn't pan out so hot. So what is it about moving to cable or what is it specifically about Comedy Central that, that makes it, you know, the success that it's been thus far? Well, I think that uh, a lot of times people confuse um, how many hits something gets with how well it would do uh, in that translation. And I think that's somewhat irrelevant because, you know, it's easy to share a cat playing with a piece of string or a talking piece of fruit or whatever, but that doesn't necessarily translate to storytelling. And uh, so I think ultimately what matters is what's the vision of the creators, what's their ability to expand it so that they are full stories being told. And uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but ultimately I think it's whether it will resonate as a show. Sure. Uh, and, it's, and I think that it's independent of how, how many views it gets. Okay. Um, 
talking about views, I'm going to turn around again. <laughs> we'll be over here. You should just do a Sharon Stone every time you turn around. Oh, good God. You know, I'm close to it. <laughs> I, I don't want just everyone to, to leave Just to keep things exciting, you know? Eh? Um, a little sexy, wait. you know? <laughs> Caroline, you are going to be sort of dealing with the international aspect, and I wonder how um, the Comedy Central brand is, is quite known uh, around the world. How do you market a show like this? to international buyers? Well, we've had some help um, from Lady Gaga this week. Uh, thank you to her for the 40 plus million people who became aware of it. Um, I mean, the great thing about something like Broad City is it's kind of publicizing itself because it's been so successful. We made the decision um, to do this down here some weeks ago and it's been the gift that keeps on giving. We've sort of, every week, we're like, oh, I can't believe it, more tweets, more good ratings, so thank you. For, and you've just done a great job selling the whole catalog that we're down here to sell, Amy, so my work here is done. I can fly <laughs> home tonight. Um, so I think something like Broad City, when you think that we're known, we're down here selling everything from South Park to SpongeBob, um, all of our new shows down here across all of the brands have all got a very heavy social media presence or they've actually generated um, from what used to be second screen. And I would arguably say, is it second screen anymore or when's that going to be first screen and broadcast will be second screen? So I think for our buyers and for our viewers, it's a very natural process for a show like this to emerge from something that's got its kind of heritage from a social media online web world and then translates to a broadcast world. And in terms of marketing it, um, we have a pretty well-oiled machine for getting comedy content out around the world. We were having the conversation backstage about comedy, you know, Amy and I were saying it's funny, isn't it, because the UK and the US have long exchanged and traded great talent and great shows. And then you've seen a sort of proliferation of that happening with a broader and broader market. Mm. Comedy has been the genre that, in broadcast terms, has probably taken the longest to get traction in every market around the world. But oddly, it's been the most shared genre in social media. Mm -hmm. So at some point, those roads are going to converge, and we're actually going to have global comedy taste. And I would say that we're really on the cusp of that now, mm -hmm. which you can see from the number of Comedy Central channels that are launching around the world, from the amount of programming that's now is globally available. It used to just be shows like South Park that would be in you know tens and tens of territories. Mm -hmm. Now shows like you know The Daily Show with Jon Stewart is enormously popular in every corner of the globe, and that is, you could have said some years ago, isn't that too American? Who's going to understand that? But people do. So I think, really, Broad City for us is kind of manna from heaven, because it is a show that's rated well, it's funny, we, we got it instantly, and I don't, I know I'm the sole Brit up here, I think Brits get it, but I think many other markets get it too. Um, and I think also the thing that makes it very easy to market, makes me feel very happy to stand behind it, is instead of the kind of girls feeling like they're out to get each other, you've kind of got each other's backs. You're part of the sisterhood, and we like that, and our <laughs> buyers like that. So, yeah, it's kind of selling itself. Thank you. We're not supposed to get emotional during these panels, right? <laughs> 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 this is group therapy, and okay, yeah, we're all gonna. It's also an intervention for yeah. one of you in the audience. So, <laughs> it's interesting what you say because. At, that is so true, what people have said for a long time, that comedy just doesn't travel, it doesn't, it doesn't translate. And one of the girls was telling me uh, about some recent research that had come across which showed that it actually is quite universal and that this has been sort of a misconception. So this is something that you're saying as well, that this, you know, people shouldn't be afraid that just because it's a New York you know, comedy that it's not going to resonate in China or anywhere else. Yeah, I think people get scared to back things. If you look at um, shows like Seinfeld and shows that have long been kind of propping up US schedules and every time I land in the States, I love Seinfeld. I can always watch it anytime. <laughs> um, but when you look at how that worked in other markets, people got nervous about scheduling it. They didn't stick with it. Um, and if you look at something like The Office, if you look at how that worked um, in its origin on BBC in the UK, 
and then what happened when it launched on NBC in the US. It wasn't an instant rating smash, mm, it but actually build, it was yeah. a slow build, and luckily the BBC stuck with it, NBC stuck with it, and it's now become something everyone's like, yeah, we invented the wheel, we knew it was great from day one, <laughs> but nobody was quite so sure. So I think there's something about having the confidence to actually get out there and saturate the marketplace internationally with new comedy and to have the confidence that actually we, we can't, let's not assume that we know what other cultures want. Let's try some stuff. And I think what you're doing on Broad City, I mean, there are certain markets where the menage a trois via Skype and the vibrator and the naked vacuuming, I mean, that could be difficult <laughs> in some markets, but there are plenty of places around the world where, where your show is going to work. Um, and our research that we commissioned, you know, we've got some great preparatory research commissioned um, within the Viacom family which actually just kind of told us what we knew because by then we had already launched a lot of new channels and a lot of new shows, which is that this genre is absolutely universal, but it seems to be more shared in an online environment than it does in a broadcast environment. And it's my department's job to change that. And to that's what that. we're down we, here. Trying we to do, do all of our focus group testing in Portugal now, just to make sure that everything <laughs> will be global. I, 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 do, I, I do think there is uh, a universality ab about y y uh, young people's uh, ability to tell when something isn't authentic. I think that young people are, are aware now uh, from social media what feels authentic to them. And I think that that's, uh, that you find that in countries all over the world. People really wanting and needing something that feels true and real to them. And, and also being very suspicious when it's not, mm. you know? Really being able to sniff it out in a way. If people are thrown together and cast in something and, and something is kind of created by somebody else and there's no, there's no real kind of origin story behind it, young people are very savvy to that now and they can tell. So I think authenticity is interesting and sometimes often important in comedy and I think that's what people pick up on. I know it is for me when I watch shows from other countries. And, and you guys are nothing if not authentic, right? How close to your characters are you? Um, Stand up. <laughs> St I mean, we have different last names. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we have different last names. We changed our names legally for the show um, to the character names, JK, LOL. Um, I think uh, we like amplify our differences because that is funny to us, but it's, it's scary, I think. This experience, it's scary how close we yeah, are. We, like, we heighten certain parts of ourselves that, we f that are different, you just said that. Um, but but um, yeah, like, like it's the, the, the things we find fun to play with that are our differences, I think we, um, we blow up a little bit. Like, Alana's not as crazy as she is on the show. I like do the <laughs> neck moves or whatever, but like I'm not like, I like to go to sleep early, you know what I mean? <laughs> but like in the, in the writer's room, for example, um, starting from a, a storyline that's happened to us or friends of ours or something, it's like so thrilling that it's like, this is gonna be on TV. <laughs> it's crazy, when it's real, it it's feels even crazier than making it up. Like the finale, my mom, yeah. um, called me and oof, said, oof. this isn't going to be shown, right? <laughs> My mom was like, I want to talk about the finale episode. Um, who, who did that happen to in should we, the Should we talk room? about what happened in the finale? Oh, yeah. um, Abby's character is... Which you directed, did you know? That's not? right. I directed... Uh, they, um, Abby's character had a really nice night, and she, they're in a very fancy restaurant, and the whole episode is, look at us, finally, we're fancy for once. And then she goes into a bathroom and she pees out a condom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I'm not saying who it is based on here, but I'm just saying my mom thinks most things that happen to Abby happen to another lady in the writer's room. <laughs> so I'll take the heat. I you guys keep care. that to yourselves. I don't even care. I'm like, your mom can think I'm a big old trash bag. No, not <laughs> you. I didn't even mean you. Oh, just I like... Mean, in, I meant like... It's that, it happened to someone in the writer's like room. Mom. Teresa. It's not me. Like it's you crazy. Make up. <laughs> Their lives are crazy in there. You're like, that's Teresa. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. Teresa. It happened to Teresa. She will never meet Teresa. What is that like now saying, <laughs> saying writer's room? Because I presume that with the web series, you didn't necessarily have a writer's room. So what, how, have you, how has it actually evolved in terms of what you are doing 
the, the process for you going from the web to television? Yeah, in the web series, Alana and I were working at this, um, a group buying website together. <laughs> it's, it's a similar job that Alana has on the show. We were sitting next to each other, kind of pretending to work, and we would like <laughs> kind of half write scripts on uh, Gchat, Google Mail. And, um, you know, we still got the job done. We were able to multitask. Uh, but now we have, like, a room of amazingly talented writers that we've gotten to pick from that have all their life experiences to add. Yeah, I mean, there's this um, creative funneling that we get to do now with our days being able to be filled with Broad City. It's, like, such a dream. It is crazy amazing, cramazing. And um, <laughs> write that down, write that down. Write that, <laughs> print it, quote it, send it, send it, Put it on the pizza. to somebody or something. Um, but, uh, you know, there's these like, we were just saying earlier to someone about, you know, res like certain restrictions that kind of help us, you know, like if for like uh, for the music, for example, um, in the show. We have to find like these underground artists, and in a way, it keeps us truer to our original um, sense than on the web series. It was like, sure, Michael Jackson, I love Michael Jackson, and it's like, yeah, you could just put whatever, anything out there, or you could, you know, and not not that we did like nudity, but like cursing or something. It's like cool to have these. Um, you like the constraints or the yeah, the, the it's, parameters. It's that helpful, are more defined. and it helps us fine-tune what we want to push. But I, I would add that um, in these kinds of shows, there's a lot of, uh, especially with such young, you know, inexperienced creators who are creating, writing, producing, and performing, um, oftentimes, even if they start out in a good way, it's, it's really difficult to maintain and to grow it. And a testament to Abby and Alana is that they are in charge of the writer's room, and they have such a strong vision of what the show is, they actually have really kind of betrayed their own youth with what strong leaders they are. And that's why they've been able to collaborate with other writers and just keep you know, flourishing and expanding it out. That, and that's another testament to them. And also, Comedy Central, um, you know, I've never <laughs> heard of uh, an experience like we're having. Um, you know, it's usually like, the network, oh, what are they gonna say? But we're like, we like cannot wait for notes because it helps us, um, you know, Kent and Brooke and Amy, it, our voice is pushed, at, you know, our voice. It's not like some separate agenda. The, it, it's such a progressive idea to, to, you know, make the most broad city, broad city that there can be. It's not like the most, some other show or this is a, a, a version of another show. It's, we're really um, pushed creatively to find and That goes back voice. to the, to the authenticity that yeah, you were talking about. Yeah, and also I think about. what makes Broad City interesting and what is kind of demanded now of shows is um, diversity um, in, in cast, in voice. Um, it's almost impossible to have a show about New York City with like six people, six white people living in a building, you know? And the character of Alana is like constantly regretting that she is in another race, just wishing. That she, and just so fascinated by race, and you guys talk about it all the time, race and class. And um, it's a very diverse room and a very diverse cast, and Abby and Alana are always pushing for that because that's kind of how they live their lives. That's, wh that's what your lives are now, is this, and what most 20-year-olds' lives are is this beautiful mix of a lot of different ethnicities and races and points of view. So I think the bro that what's, that's what makes... Broad City Broad. Yeah, not so much the comedy. <laughs> now, you directed the finale, and you also did a cameo in there. Are we going to see you turn up in season two? I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I would be happy to do anything, but uh, I think uh, what's fun about that show, well, who knows, but the, what's fun about that show is people kind of dip in and out, and, you know, much like living in a big city, you see weird, strange people um, they're like uh, extras in, in, your, in the movie of your life. And sometimes they play a big part of your day and sometimes they walk by. And I know we were playing around with some season two stuff where we see some people kind of come and go. We're creating this bigger environment. With Parks and Recreation, for example, we loved creating a fake town and the people that inhabited it. And they were all, you know, glorious weirdos. So I think um, 
I would certainly, you know, if the, if the money's right, I'll come back. <laughs> we'll talk about it. What about any other... You've, you had some, some really kind of cool guest stars in season one. What about any wish, anybody on your wish list for season two? Oh, there's, like, so many. Like, it's we kind of are constantly like, oh, my God, I wonder if they could, would do it, you know? Lady um, Gaga. Lady Gaga. Well, we had a She's whole a conversation fan, right? about so. that. We reached out to Felicia Rashad last year. We're going to ask her... I think, like, the 13th time would be like, all right, we're over it. keep sending scripts to Felicia Rashad. <laughs> Mrs. Cosby. Yes, yeah, Mrs. Okay. Cosby. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, my dream is to have Frank Ocean. Because I think Frank Ocean is the future of everything. <laughs> there you go. We're down He's with watching. that. Frank um, Ocean. Yeah, uh, Frank, are you here? <laughs> Frank. Oh, I see. Oh, there you oh. are. He's beautiful. No, don't Even. get up. Frank, stay. Sit. Down. Frank. Well, you oh. know, let's go check it out yeah. backstage because we're cool. going to have to wrap this up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for being here. Thanks so much. Thank you. Continued yeah, success. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline.